And I, I know there was a lot of information in that last panel. I hope you can grab uh, some of the speakers afterward if you had some questions for them. Uh, they had a lot of information to pass to us. Push the button. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks to everybody for staying to the uh, to the last panel here to give our our panel a good audience for uh, this last discussion. Um, th I think this one's appropriate to close the panel part of the uh, of the uh, symposium, and that is when the grid goes down. Uh, everything we've talked about today uh, really kind of boils down to that question: What do we do when the grid goes down? Uh, this should be a good discussion led by our, our good friend Jeff Cairns, uh, program manager also at Norwich at the Applied Research Institute there at uh, Norwich. And, and again, thank you to the Norwich team for being a great partner here today. So, Jeff, over to you, sir. Well, I'm the last panel here along with uh, my colleagues. And if you, anybody needs any motivation, I, I was in the second row over here. I stood up and started walking that way. If you need motivation, take a look at TW Socks right there. Man, he's got some good looking socks. <laughs> a motivating guy there. Uh, it, it, at any rate, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank AUSA, uh, General Brown and the team, uh, Pat Scanlon went above and beyond, and the rest of the team really did a super job for this. The G9, thank you for hosting this. And then for everybody for attending, a little bit of background on this. Tom Bazzotta was just up here. Phil Sussman was up here. Um, we're in the third year of a BAA contract with the Corps of Engineers, broad area announcement contract. Uh, the first year was analysis. Take a look at the education requirements for energy resilience. Second year was design and development. We ran a couple pilots. Uh, Fred ran one of those pilots. Uh, and then the third year, which we're in right now, uh, is to run undergraduate courses. We've got maybe 220 folks that have gone through the undergraduate courses with energy resilience. Uh, and the last one was about internships. Uh, the second one was Fred's, which was focused on doing a senior leader seminar. It was for 10 people. So Fred said, why not team up with AOSA and have 120 people? Why not? It's a much better opportunity. Uh, that said, We've got a distinguished panel here today, and distinguished in a way that can help you uh, network, understand, and then uh, continue to network on lessons learned. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the panel specifically, but we'll just go down the line. Alex, would you introduce yourself and uh, get started? Yeah, happy to. So Alex Pena, Director of Converge Strategies, but really, you know, outside of the introduction there, I really appreciated hearing all the panelists that have been up here and all the ways that there's so many different puzzle pieces that we have that are coming together on this one roof and, and starting to be there. And there's one that is near and dear to my heart, which is the Black Start exercises. Folks have mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, I actually had the privilege of leading the team that worked with OSD to create the Black Start exercise framework and then putting that framework into practice at Army Installations First. Uh, started with Fort Stewart, Fort Greeley, and then Fort Bragg was actually the, the next one that came after. That was part of that sponsored program. So for me, just being able to, to see that in practice and seeing folks talk about something that we started in 2018 is extremely encouraging to see that it hasn't just been a pilot that just went somewhere and just a flash in the pan, that this idea of resilience and, and looking at the installation and what it can do is something that we're all taking heart of. So I just wanted to, to put that out there before I, I kept going. In terms of the actual Black Start exercise themselves, because I'm sure folks are, hey, tell us about the pull the plugs, what'd you find? Tell us all the crazy stuff and, and what's actually going on in these systems. Unfortunately, just to be frank, there were a lot of things that we found, uh, a lot of easy things, but things that we all assumed would work perfectly fine. And I think that, that again, is the, the message to come out of these exercises and why they're so important to continue is how conducting these things under a blue sky environment when we can control them so that we're not faced with them in the black sky environment or when an adversary, as we've heard about the cybersecurity risks and all the things that are potentially threatening our grid system, being prepared for that and knowing what we're gonna do ahead of time is a, a really important piece. The tying it back to, to why we're here to talk about partnerships, 
really comes that these exercises so far have focused on inside the fence line. You know, every time we go through the planning and we work on these, it's here's the fence line boundary, here's who's going to play, here's who we're going to exclude because we don't want to cause pain on them. And typically those are our partners outside the fence line. We don't have necessarily the ability to influence them and have them participate. We understand it's a, a struggle, but we choose to currently exclude them from our planning and our exercise activities. And I think this is really an opportunity to evolve the way that we've done our exercises so far. There's nothing stopping us from reaching across the exercise, reaching across that you know invisible boundary, if you will, and having all the experts who are there. We we heard from utilities, we heard from communication providers, we will from even on the, the panelists here about some of the capabilities they have and how they're the experts. And being able to bring them into the fold and being able to test all of our MOUs, MOAs, you know, even the joint response agreements that we have, these are all things that we could do as part of exercises that already exist. And it's not that hard to start building that muscle memory of working these uh, relationships, again, under the same framework of a controlled environment, but just doing it with folks outside the fence line as well. So that's just one of the things. There's obviously challenges of how we deal with requirements. You know, I think uh, it was Monica was talking about the requirements that we need and, and being able to start talking about those. Obviously, some of our requirements are classified. No kidding, right? But there are ways to describe some of these requirements in ways that aren't classified to take out the actors, to take out some of the things, and or maybe even create example scenarios. So there are things that we can do to start helping these people have seats at the table. And that's just something I'll, I'll leave there and, and pass along to the rest of the panelists, but just something to think about. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Lamb, the garrison commander at Fort Hunter Liggett and also uh, Parks Reserve Forces Training Area. Let me start by saying thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to U AUSA. And also thank you very much for saving the very best panel for last. Um, I, I wanna start off by just giving you a little uh, context about my uh, garrison. And, and then I'll talk a little bit about our energy projects as well as uh, some partnerships. So Fort Hunter Liggett is the Army Reserve's largest installation and the seventh largest Army installation within the continental United States. Um, my installation sits on roughly 165,000 acres of mostly uninhabited um, land, and it's uh, unencroached by any urban area. So we're located in Central California, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Fort Hunter Liggett. And we're near the coast, but not on the coast. And we're nearly halfway between Los Angeles and Sacramento, uh, with uh, Fort Hunter Liggett serving as a premier total force training center because of its austere terrain, remote location, and the opportunity to train year-round in sunny California. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek. We're not, uh, I don't want you to get the wrong impression, we're not sitting on the beach, um, and we're not uh, uh, sunbathing all day in sunny California. What I've, I've heard is that uh, most people say, Fort Hunter Leggett has everything a soldier needs and absolutely nothing a soldier wants. <clears throat> so again, just to give you a little um, idea of where we are, we are a little over an hour from the nearest Walmart. So if you don't have a Walmart nearby, you know you are remote and isolated. Um, along with my sub-installation in the San Francisco Bay Area, Parks Reserve Forces Training Area, also known as PRIFTA and another Army Reserve installation. Uh, both of these installations offer complementary training capabilities for individual military skills training and collective unit training to all U.S. military components and our allied partners. So um, at Fort Hunter Leggett and at uh, PRIFTA, we have, in addition to Army Reserve training, we, ha we have uh, the Navy Seabees that come out and train on our installation, and they do a number of troop construction projects for us that uh, saves uh, the Army money, as well as uh, is a great training opportunity for the Navy. 
Um, we have the Marine Corps trains there at Fort Hunter Leggett, uh, Air Force. We've uh, some of our, our allied partners include um, the British Royal Air Force, uh, as well as uh, the Philippine Army. We just had a visit by Lieutenant General Bronner, who was uh, here uh, earlier this last week and visited with um, General McConville, and then he came straight out to Fort Hunter Liggett uh, as well. We tr train, um, we have FBI train out there, as well as a lot of our state and um, uh, local partners. That said, energy resilience matters to Fort Hunter Leggett Garrison because reliable and secure access to both energy and water are critical components of not only our USAR mission, but the total force. Being situated in a remote and isolated location, um, it, it goes without saying that Fort Hunter Leggett Garrison must remain postured to combat uh, threats against our resources whether they're natural or man-made. Having uninterrupt, uninterrupted access to energy and water in, ensures Army Reserve soldiers can continue to maintain base operations while supporting local and federal agencies uh, when the grid goes down. So um, just to tell you a little bit about our some of our microgrid projects, on both Fort Hunter Liggett and at PRIFTA. Uh, I'll start with telling you my story. I've only been in command a little less than 10 months. And I took command last June, the 30th of June. And after 24 hours in command, I was told that, hey, Fort Hunter Liggett has been selected to brief uh, the White House Council on an environmental, um, uh, in environmental, uh, Someone said it, <laughs> my apologies. But um, so my background is not in energy resiliency. I'm a logistics officer and uh, a force manager. And so uh, I stayed up, studied for the test all night. And after 48 hours in command, I had a chance to uh, brief the White House. And we were the only, only Army uh, installation selected to do that. So I've had a crash course in energy resiliency. I'm not the subject matter expert. Obviously, I've brought my subject matter expert, my energy manager is here in the room with me today. So if you have questions on these projects, I'm going to have him help me out here. Um, but what my expertise is, is in partnerships, building relationships, and ensuring that we continue to build relationships between our installation and within our community to continue with our mission assurance. And so we have, uh, back last May, we broke ground um, with our partners, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as uh, Amoresco, who is here in the room as well. And um, we will, we are looking to uh, be at net zero by this December. So with our, our microgrid there at Fort Hunter Liggett. We also have a secondary wastewater uh, treatment facility that uh, will start construction on that in June. And we have a partnership with Sierra Energy uh, for our waste uh, to energy demonstration project. So that's all at Fort Hunter Leggett and then at Parks Reserve Forces Training Area. We've uh, broke ground this past August uh, with our partner Lawrence Berkeley Labs and California Energy Commission on our R2M2, and that's not to be confused with R2D2, but R2M2 resilient uh, replicable uh, modular microgrid project. And that has 10 individual nodes that work together or separate for our uh, energy um, sustainability projects there. And then um, I would say lastly, I'll just share with you the absolute importance of community relationships to a garrison commander. We don't uh, receive you know, our, we don't come up in the Army learning all about partnering outside of the fence line. Uh, but these partnerships are critical uh, for what we do uh, on our installation. And um, from the start of this symposium, we've heard from uh, starting with General Brown talking about community partnerships and installation connective tissue and how important that is and how that gets after some of our resource uh, constraints. 
Uh, we heard from the deputy G9 who talked about uh, training garrison commanders and how important it is for at the grassroots level with garrison commanders that they are out in the community and involved in uh, all of our partnerships. We heard from the Honorable Sharon Burke, we can't sit around and wait for the grid to go down, right? We need to be proactive. And as a garrison commander, that's exactly what I do. I, I am in the room and a part of uh, all of these efforts to ensure we maintain our partnerships. And we heard from uh, Mr. Fred Muir, who out in California, we affectionately refer to him as the godfather of partnerships. Um, he talked about the impact of the senior commander's involvement in community partnerships. And uh, finally, uh, one of uh, the other panel members, the No Bro Network panel member, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but uh, we, he, he talked about cannot build trust during a crisis. It is imperative that we are doing that before the grid goes down. And with that, I will yield my time and I look forward to your questions. I'm sorry, I'm a retired army officer, so without PowerPoint, I'm really unable to speak. I, I, I don't know how you did that. Uh, so uh, I retired a few years ago and now I work for AT&T. And uh, a few years ago, we talked about being attacked, being resilient on the homeland. We remember, of course, 9-11, and communications were down, and the communications that were up were not able to communicate with each other. First responders couldn't talk to one another. And so as a result of the 9-11 Commission, uh, we formed a government agency called FirstNet Authority to build FirstNet, a first responder network for the nation. And AT&T won that contract in 2017. It's a 25-year contract. And under that, we have uh, priority and preemption, meaning that uh, when a redneck like me is trying to upload photos of the tornado to Facebook, that first responder who's calling for help or resources, his call will go ahead. And if there's enough chuckleheads like me trying to clog the network, I'll actually get preempted and bumped off so that that signal will go through. Uh, we have a separate network core that's monitored 24 seven for security. Uh, we have deployables. So a lot of times, uh, when I was uh, an AGR officer at Army Reserve Command and Maria hit Puerto Rico, the towers were destroyed. And you may recall a similar situation with Hurricane Sandy. So we now have deployable antennas with masts and drones that are flying antennas and so forth that we can deploy. And we have a service level agreement to be there within 14 hours. So when it comes to resiliency, we got the test ourselves. And it was not a blue sky test or a controlled test but rather a, a very uncontrolled test on the worst possible day of the year uh, when someone um, on Christmas morning, 2020, someone detonated an explosion outside of an AT&T building in Nashville, Tennessee, and it caused significant physical damage, including a crater in the east side of our building. A lot of the buildings around the, our facility were destroyed. Uh, our facility was actually hardened and, and survived the initial blast. In fact, our network equipment I uh, was not directly knocked out by the blast and our mobility services and network services, including FirstNet, continue operating on temporary battery power throughout the morning. Uh, the problem was then phase two was that we were unable to get into the building for 12 hours, a little bit to do with safety concerns. They didn't want our employees going into the building, but they were also concerned with collecting evidence. And so the, uh, I don't know if sure it was the FBI, the BATF, or both wouldn't let us into the building to restore ourselves as we got going. So uh, first responder network uh, operations, though, continued. So at least while we weren't allowed the building, the guys holding us out had priority and preemption and were able to communicate well outside of the building. And that was obviously a, a really a big deal. Uh, we deployed more than 20 first net deployables to the area, though, as, as we realized that we were going to lose our network because of, of, of being able to do the things we needed to do to keep running. And so with our deployables, we had satellite backhaul to that separate network core, and the first responders at least were able to continue to communicate. Now, the magnitude of the explosion was severe. Um, I don't know who else's network could take this type of a, of a direct kinetic attack and still survive, um, but the national calls were rerouted, Nash, um, rerouted remotely, meaning that without getting into the building, all of the calls that we would normally take through that region of the country were sent in a different direction. But uh, regional calls uh, were affected. And thanks to a lot of uh, her, uh, dedicated efforts of our team, 
Uh, most of that service was restored within 48 hours. We're able to get back into the building, resume power, and get power, uh, communications working back within the region. Uh, both AT&T and FirstNet Authority have committed significant resources to build out the network uh, and, and uh, enhance communications among first responders and mem members of the public safety community. However, this was only year three of that contract, and we were still building out segments of our network. So there are a few things that we can we learned and we, we think others can learn as well. Uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is why we're here invited to this forum today, their wireline services, their network services went down. And they were first net customers. They were ready to go with priority and preemption, except that all the phones were locked and secured in a cage and all the SIM chips were not yet in the phones. So they had to go get the devices, add the SIM chips, and then figure out who should get the phones. And so what we're saying is that while we give you this really cool phone, it is a phone and it works all the time. So you should carry that phone. That should be your primary phone. A user should be on, on FirstNet with your position. Uh, we need to find a balance between uh, tasks such as crime scene evidence collection and a public safety network. Um, clearly, the FBI and the BATF needed to complete that mission. We're all on board. But at the same time, there should have been some way to which we could have balanced out the task to keep the network going for the rest of the country. Uh, wireless um, area network backup to the public uh, safety answering point and the, uh, the computer-aided dispatch. This is your 911 service. When they lost their wireline, their grounded terrestrial network, they lost their ability to function. And there are routers that take the, what would normally go over wireline and make it wireless. And with that wireless capability, they can now use those deployables that we're obligated to bring in. We had assets on the ground within four hours. Uh, the service level agreement is 14. We had people on the ground within four hours. So we continue to bring in more assets uh, as this situation developed. Uh, that for uh, 911 uh, service could have been going over wireless communications as well. We also have uh, CRDs or compact rapid deployment kits. It's basically something that you would think of pulling with a pickup truck or putting in a pickup truck. Uh, when we turn it on, it senses is there a cell tower in the area that's functioning. If it is, it doesn't do anything. If it senses that there is no signal, then it starts using satellite backhaul and you resume communications. Places like Fort Campbell and other agencies should have those things uh, already on hand. We've done a lot to enhance our security and uh, our capability to res resume things like this in, in the future. The other thing is that this is the America's first responder network. It's not a slogan. It's the government's network. We just happen to be contracted to build it. And we could have further adoption uh, with government agencies, with the military and, and installations so that when the network is down and these re assets are deployed to support first responders, those who support the first responders can also communicate as well. Uh, pending your questions, that's the conclusion of my brief. Hi, everybody. Uh, Mick Wasco, Marine Corps Station Miramar, San Diego. Um, Honored to, to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I usually talk a lot. And so my minimum tour is three hours up to three days. If anybody would like it, um, please come visit. But uh, I'll show you a snippet of some of the things that we've done over the pack, past decade. Try and get through this and, um, and answer your questions. Um, but as an overview, we are a very unique base and we do things very, very unique. Um, there's a lot of circumstances that made Miramar what it is. A lot of it luck, a lot of cheating and uh, breaking the rules. I promised everybody on the panel that I would say the worst thing. So everybody else looks like it. <laughs> but uh, our system is operated by government employees. Um, our microgrid is capable today of uh, islanding the base for up to 21 days. Um, and we have done that with all sorts of resources and all sorts of things um, and uh, can get into that a little bit. But the primary components are a conventional power plant, a uh, battery storage system that came from a California Energy Commission grant, um, on-site renewable power in the form of landfill gas that's about 50% of our energy right now, um, and a tremendous team of NAFAC Navy high-voltage electricians who operate this system. This whole thing um, took over 10 years um, from start to finish, and it's all about partnerships. Um, early on, I knew that 
no solution would ever come from within the fence line and have had tremendous support from my leadership uh, the entire time of going out in town, finding the solution, going out to energy exchanges and meeting people and working together. And that's how we were able to do what we were able to do. Um, some notable ones are the use of the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, we use them to develop our requirements for the microgrid and then use them to help do uh, third party commissioning of the system as well. It would not have worked without that partnership that cost money, but it was dedication and it was the, the right idea from the get go. Um, we leveraged the uh, capital investment of this microgrid system that was a lot of luck and a lot of strategy going, getting money from the Pentagon with, um, with uh, Mr. Monahan out there. <laughs> uh, but uh, we were able to take that investment and then get $5 million more from the California Energy Commission and leverage what we did. And that's what funded the battery storage and load management. Um, through the innovation of um, other entities and the ESTCP program, and if you guys are familiar with Merck, um, Merck was a, a program that originally bought, uh, brought Alex Pena to my base. And um, when I first heard about the Army doing Black Star exercises, it couldn't have been better timing for me. Um, it was exactly when I needed to do that. And um, that was just great to leverage uh, that knowledge and then um, partnering with MIT to start doing uh, Black Star exercises. Um, and then the heat wave in California, I mean, it's, it's crazy that uh, it took us 10 years to build this microgrid. And as soon as it got built, California started to have the first rolling blackouts that it's seen in 20 years. Um, and then after that, just highlighting some other partnerships, um, leveraging our ability to communicate with the California Public Utilities Commission and being at the table with that leadership and be able to ask directly, I need a microgrid specific tariff for MCS Miramar and then getting it a month later. And so that's all things that we've accomplished to date. Um, the testing itself, I could go on for hours about all of this and what we've been able to do, but I will tell you that next Saturday, we are doing our 10th base-wide blackout exercise. So uh, we're doing a lot and um, it's practice at this point. And I could tell you one of the biggest needs is we've, you know, we're, I, I appreciate so much all the discussion about the community because that's what we need next. Um, we can't even figure out how to make our operational forces care about this. It, the, line, the line is drawn, commands are what they are. It's been that way forever. But I tell you, if the operational commands are not asking for black start exercises and being the proponent of it, we will continue to just bother them. Um, there isn't, a, there isn't a common understanding. There may be at the top, but not at the ground level where everything happens. So that's, a, that's something that we can work on. Um, some lessons learned from our uh, exercise. So I guess I would note that of those 10 base-wide blackouts, uh, only one of them was during operational hours. And that was our ERI exercise. And so I would encourage us to think about all the sorts of different tests that we do and the different layers of it. I think we just say black start, but at the end of the day, there's you're doing a black start on the weekend, you're doing it after hours, you're doing it on a local area, you're doing it for a specific mission. There's so many different layers to the, these exercises that it's extremely important for us to look at all of those. Doing, uh, doing an outage and doing a test on a system when we're not disturbing operations is absolutely the first step. You know, we shouldn't be attacking our most critical infrastructure just to try it. Uh, and learn lessons. There are plenty of lessons to be learned on table talk exercises. There's, but at the end of the day, we need to get to the point where we are doing these tests without bothering anybody and it just becomes the norm. And that's what we're going for at Miramar. Um, just some information about the heat wave and the demand response. So it's crazy that, you know, 10 years ago, we were asked to try and come up with what the economic what's the, the economic justification for a microgrid? And, you know, to be honest, we just made it up and put it on paper and then did it. Um, but then, you know, fast forward 10 years later, 
And we made $25,000 in one day because of a program that was stood up in one year due to an emergency in California. In one year later, this summer, that program has doubled in value. I couldn't even update this slide because I did it last week. And this summer, if Miramar is able to support the summer heat wave this summer, we are going to make $50,000 in one day. Um, in addition to the microgrid, we also do a tremendous amount of demonstration and, and research projects. And one of the things that one of the big lessons learned is that there's a lot, of, there's a huge difference between research and and operations and and capital investment. And this, the all of these projects have been uh, put together, and we have learned so much from working with all of these new technologies and. Um, doing so in a small, confined environment and applying those lessons learned to the larger project. But once again, don't get confused with research projects and operational capability. Um, these projects are very expensive, very difficult, and very challenging, but just emphasizing the importance of doing all this um, together and, uh, and being very open-minded. Um, I think I'm just going to pass it off and, and get to Q&A because that's my favorite part. So thanks for having me. So one of the uh, one of my best commanders I've ever had uh, basically said, if you have information that you can't share with a buddy, uh, no matter where they are in an organization, then you need, don't need to be part of this organization. Share, support, et cetera. What we have is a couple of examples here in the previous panel and multiple other panels. They have an awful lot of information here to share. Number one, I'd ask the question, um, what's the status of human capital, our human uh, assets in terms of understanding what's needed within the energy resilience uh, uh, community? We know that there's an education piece, there's a training piece. Um, even within cyber, there's multiple specialties within that. Uh, I'd probably start with you, Alex, and, and we'll just go down the row. Uh, you could talk a little bit about the Merck program. I know we referenced that, but I don't think everybody really knows what that that is and uh, and how that networks actually help not only an energy resilience program be developed, but multiple other functions. So, Yeah, so going on to, to Merck and what it is, so it's the Military Energy Resilience Catalyst. The, the goal behind that program is really to bring together installation energy managers and just energy practitioners across different installations and have them form cohorts so that they can talk to each other, learn from each other, see what the lessons learned are, and then take them back to their own installations and implement those things. One of the things as we were traveling across the sites that we saw was there was a lot of siloing between just installations of them themselves and not being able to, to share information so you're not recreating the wheel every single time. So that was the, the genesis behind that program. Uh, started as an ESTC, ESTCP program in 2018. Uh, actually just got re-upped for another three-year program uh, doing the same thing. So if there are folks who are interested in that and it may be, may be something you'd like, come talk to us afterwards. I'm happy to, to enroll folks who are, who are looking at that now. But the in terms of the question that you brought up a little bit about the human capital that's needed for, for this program, you know, I am an aerospace engineer by training uh, and then I did system design and, and essentially analysis. And I walked into this field, unfortunately, blind to what was going on in 2016. And through years, I had to learn on the fly and understand all these things. And it's scary at first. People say, oh, you need to be an electrical engineer to understand everything that's happening at the utility level to put all these pieces together. It really doesn't take that. It takes a curious mind, someone to ask, what if, is this assumption correct? And really start pushing on those things. So there's that, I'll call it a mentality piece, at least in my experience that I've seen, has been more important for, for the capital side. But also doesn't change the fact that there needs to be training. Uh, we do these exercises not just to go to a base and see what we can break and you know slap someone on the wrist. It's really to give everyone an opportunity to practice something before they have to do it for real. And I think that's the kind of training and activities that is necessary and more of, because right now, even if you look at the next five years, Congre Congress has only mandated five Black Start exercises per service per year. There's a lot more installations than that. And there's a lot more people. And just getting that widespread adoption isn't there yet in terms of making sure everyone has this experience and, and is able to be trained in this. And the best way to learn is to do it. Um, that's how, how I feel about things, but happy to pass it off and see what other folks think. Okay, that's that's a great question. 
uh, the value of human capital. So I'll talk about uh, two aspects of this. First is having institutional knowledge at our installations, right? We don't have, I don't have on my TDA, neither a green suitor nor a GS, a DA civilian that has any experience or, or is my energy manager. No experience in, in, in energy resiliency. I have one energy manager. He is a contractor. And I, I mean, he is it. And so if we lose Jared Ross, then we lose all of the institutional knowledge of energy resiliency at our installation. And so I think um, that right there speaks to the value of human capital uh, within the installation uh, TDA or the installation organization structure. The second piece of it is collaboration and um, constant communication outside the gate. Um, we have at Fort Hunter Leggett a very robust community relations executive board and a community relations working group. And we pull in all of the community leaders, uh, elected officials, um, our local fire departments and all of the local police departments and, and collaborating with our community, I think builds that uh, human capital to continue these partnerships. We have um, a number of IGSAs, the Intergovernmental Inter um, Service Support Agreements, and uh, Mr. Ivan Bolden, who I know had to leave, uh, he's been really critical in helping us uh, develop those within our, uh, our installations. And, and there are huge cost savings uh, for the government, but I, I would just say that overall collaboration and communication outside of our fence line builds that human capital. So uh, that's a hard question, but uh, I did a research paper for my war college on cooperating between the Army Reserve and National Guard with industry and academia for cyber warfare. And I expected, because everyone knows that we have a shortage of people who are going into these fields. We have more cyber jobs coming open than we can possibly fill in the country. And I thought they were going to talk about developing personnel together. And one large network provider said, that doesn't really help me because if I train somebody and they work for you on the weekends, that's cool. But if you're going to call them up on during a crisis, all we're really doing is rearranging the deck chairs. Because as industry, I'm fighting the same opponent in the same battle that you are, and you're just taking them from one side of the fight to the other. It's the same fight. That made sense. But to go along with what Lisa said, what they asked me for was for threat intelligence. Is there a way that the military, the government can share threat intelligence with industry and vice versa? And that gets kind of sporty because some of the things that I learned industry was collecting, they wouldn't necessarily want to tell the government agent how they got that information. Uh, but I had to, and I, and when I had to explain how to share information in a way that gets nobody in trouble, but that they share threat intelligence information and they th uh, share techniques and tactics and procedures uh, for cyber and for things like that across the two. So um, the human component led to the success of our of our project. Um, halfway through building the microgrid, um, or since the beginning of the microgrid, we basically knew that we needed an operator and we needed a team and we needed to be on the operational side. Um, we created a new billet and we hired a dedicated microgrid operator to come on board um, prior to the system being commissioned. Uh, that was critical to success. Now that we expect resilience, it is all about the people. He is one guy and he's in the process of training other people. We still have not figured out how to be able to have enough people to do what we need to do. And that is a work in progress, but um, that's the next step. I think a lot of people are thinking about how to build microgrids, but the most important thing is going to be sustaining them. And um, that is historically something that we have always failed at, and we can't afford to fail at it any longer. So I've got a question specifically for uh, Colonel Lamb. Uh, first of all, a huge congrats. How did you get to net zero? Uh, and 
what blockers did you have to face on the way? I realized that December is implementation, right? But maybe you can chat a bit to that. Yes. So we're not at net zero yet. Um, so hold the congrats. <laughs> we'll have the party after. Um, we are working uh, towards that. And our net zero um, goal is 14 days of resiliency for all of our mission critical uh, facilities. And so that would, that does not include our housing area. That does not include um, some of our other, you know, AFIs, things like that. But all of our mission critical facilities, the goal is uh, net zero uh, by December and 14 days of, um, of resiliency. Um, what was the second part of the question? How? Congratulations. Oh. I, I just stopped the blockers. <laughs> I just stopped how do we stop the blockers? So um, I I always say uh, the blockers being like our uh, our hurdles. our our Thanks. hurdles. One of the biggest hurdles I know for a lot of my peers uh, is usually within inside of the organization, like our SJA, who um, <laughs> is a part of the No Brigade. And so <clears throat> I I don't believe in the No Brigade. I'm, I'm a commander. I, I take risk along with my senior commander and uh, the staff works for me. And so uh, the very first thing I did when I came on board is I uh, educated my staff on what my priorities are and that my priorities are aligned with my senior commander and the Army, uh, the CAR, uh, the Chief of Army Reserve, um, as well as MCOM commander, as well as AMC, and that's people first and partnerships. And that's one of my top priorities. And so I, I sat my SJA down and I said, you know, I respect what you do and I don't want you to let me go to jail. However, <clears throat> we have to get to yes. There are things that we need to do here to make our installation more resilient and we need to get to yes. So help me get to yes. You heard a couple of who is there. Yeah. <laughs> it is the last panel of the day. I understand there's a, um, here's a question probably for everybody. Um, what is the magnitude of the need for strategic reserves? Now everybody's involved in some sort of element of the resilient process, which means not only knowing what you have, preparing for disaster, exercising, uh, but then there's a piece that comes at the end that I just don't have this. What else do we need in terms of reserves, transformers, switch gear, et cetera? Is that something you can identify, uh, um, Alex? Is that something that comes up in your exercises? I'd say to, to date in terms of the exercise we've done, Unfortunately, we haven't even got that far. And that's the the thing that I think is why they've been so important and why I've stuck with them is that we're still looking at making sure our UPSs are plugged into the same outlet that is powered by our generator. That's that's currently the level where we're at, where we don't even know if our generators are running correctly because we aren't doing the testing, the load testing. So I think it's a a good point for us to strive for. Obviously we need it. I'm not saying like, don't focus on strategic reserves. We absolutely need those types of things and components, but there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit, no cost, simple policy changes, or even checks that can be done that don't cost money that you can do right now that we can just raise the threshold and ensure that some of our critical missions are actually supported. So I'll dodge the question a little bit, um, but just in terms of, of things that I've seen it, it it's much simpler than strategic reserves at this point of things that we can fix. So talk to you in a year and uh, you'll have some more information. I'm sure. Yeah. Colonel Lamb. Um, strategic reserves. So um, when you, when you first asked the question, I started thinking about, I, I'm a reserve officer and I started thinking about the uh, army reserve and I was thinking, yeah, we're not strategic anymore. We're operational. Um, and all of the things that the uh, Army Reserve is involved in, um, for instance, um, support, uh, uh, tongue-tied, um, support to uh, civ uh, civil authorities and for disasters and things like that. 
Um, but I, but I, I believe that again, and going back to uh, partnerships, it, it is critical to have uh, those uh, strategic reserves there on our installations. And um, you mentioned the generator and, and uh, we just had a situation recently with uh, a generator and um, uh, some, some critical um, facilities there at Fort Hunter Liggett. And I, you know, won't dare, I don't dare uh, air all of our dirty laundry, but um, having uh, the right backup generators for some of our facilities, uh, absolutely critical. So for me, thinking strategic reserves is difficult because everything we do is expensive. If you look at what it costs is simply to run a mile of fiber, it's expensive. But one thing when you're looking at resources and how you pay for those, I would encourage the Army, don't build your own stovepipes. An example would be there was talk earlier of building an Army 5G program. Well, we have several major industries, companies within the United States who are building 5G as fast as they can go. So instead of building something that you have to build and maintain, why not look to industry where they're already doing those exact same things and ask them to continue to do it for you. And in the case of FirstNet, uh, we have band 14, which is a slice of the spectrum that's specific for first responders when they need it. But as I mentioned, preemption and knocking guys like me off the net so that the first responder can talk, well, we allocate our network. We take all of our other customers out of the way to make room for that first responder. So there's a lot of capacity within industry that in a national emergency could be allocated in the right way. And it could become your de facto uh, strategic reserve, but also help you provide resources on your day-to-day -day operations. Um, I think it can go so many different ways. When I think of the equipment, there's just so many single points of failure and all this. And an important thing to keep in mind is that microgrids are a redundancy to the utility and the utility is very, very good. So I don't know how feasible it is to have uh, replacements for everything, but uh, the, the grid assurance stuff was very interesting that that's done on a, at a wide scale. Um, but what keeps me up at night is just that we're thinking about it from an energy perspective, and it's really not. It's really a human problem, and the resilience challenge is energy is just one small component, and we're really the only ones talking about it. And um, it really needs to be holistic with water, food, um, wastewater. If we're not involving our communities and we're still thinking about our fence line, we are absolutely in trouble. Why talk about 14 days? Why do we even talk about 14 days? If Can you imagine? You know, it is just, it is so much bigger than electricity. Um, it's, it's everything. And we need to think of that level. With that, I think I'm what, probably under a minute now, so we don't have time for a question. I just urge everybody here, essentially what we've done is a, a series of uh, small case studies. In some cases, what soldiers are used to is a battle analysis where we kind of break things down, try to get another perspective so we can frame that and in, in what we're doing. So I'd encourage you to, as General Swan said, to network, continue that conversation uh, as you move forward. Um, a lot of Fantastic opportunities and uh, wealth of information up here. Thank you very much, panel.